1 Corinthians 3 1 and I brethren could not speak unto you as spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ I have fed you with milk and not with meat for hitherto you were not able to bear it neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal it's interesting that he opens this text with calling them brethren and then not two verses down he said but you are still carnal for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions are ye not carnal and walk as mere men for while one saith I am of Paul and another I am of Apollos are ye not carnal who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believe even as the Lord gave to every man I have planted Apollos has watered but God gave the increase so then neither is he that planteth anything neither he that watereth but God giveth the increase now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor for we are laborers together with God ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon we're closing here but let every man take heed on how he buildeth there upon father thank you for your word in Jesus name amen this morning for about 30 minutes I'm talking to you about a formula for increase a formula for increase there is a way to increase and before I set this up on the setting of the text I'd like you to just elbow the neighbor you have not been talking to most because that neighbor is sick of you already I want you to elbow the, the, the other neighbor and tell them it's time to increase it's time to increase I'd like you to let them know that that increase is not just an event but increase is also a season say yes and uh, I feel in my spirit that many of you are on schedule for an increase uh, God has been doing some things around you and for you but he's doing some things in you so that you can handle how he intends to increase you and the people of God said amen I am a student of the epistles of Paul and one of the things that it is important that you realize is I only preach the scripture in context uh, because it is the context that helps you to understand the content and it's very difficult to get accurate insight from the scripture without accurate background uh, and in each of the epistles of Paul you find that there are different writing attitudes and you find that there are different tones and there are different emphasis points in how he writes to his churches for example to the Romans it held the theme of righteousness and the gospel of grace he writes the antithesis of their issue a lot of times when the Apostle Paul writes in his letters what he's doing is giving diagnostics and directives he does not just diagnose or discern what he feels like is the problem or the deficit what he does is he diagnoses and then gives direction there's some moving room there in any instance in life if you have a diagnosis it's enough to kill you if it's not followed up with direction when God is trying to treat a thing he has to reveal and assess what you're dealing with so more important than the diagnosis is the direction where do I go from what's been diagnosed if you think about any malady and any issue in the human body doctors diagnose but more important than their diagnosis they also direct 
correct from this diagnosis you will now do this and you will now not do that be very careful of providing direction before you've given an accurate diagnosis and uh, the book of Romans shows us that because it is important that you understand Roman culture Romans were very legal people they were very legal they they held fast to centurion principle and a part of what they did in scholarly fashion was they held fast to justice in and after moral law so they didn't believe in spiritual law because they didn't believe that law could be spiritual so they had a very oppressed culture a monotheistic culture a polytheistic sorry culture that was ruled and regulated by whichever God provided first and from that place they developed a very legalist attitude and so they were resistant to the gospel in Rome so Paul had to do a lot of labor in talking about righteousness and grace say yes and then we get to the book of Ephesians where the theme is ecclesiology or the mystery of the church the mystery of the church you will find that at Ephesus there was a bunch of networking there was a lot of people that would gather together around topics and things and there was uh, cultural gang banging and familial bang gang banging and then there was I even this a uh, familial status war between what family line you were born to because in that day depending upon what family line you were born to hey Moy Cali it implied your economic standing and so they would use their standing as the basis of salvation and the premise of salvation so what Paul achieves through his letters to the Ephesians was he let them know that this new thing you're about to come into this body this amalgam this consortium this ecclesia which means one that were called out to be brought in what you're about to be brought into is a body and and what makes this a mystery is uh, I'm going to take men from different lives and literally different stories and different backgrounds and different professions and different careers and I'm gonna make them one body and so Paul writes that it's a mystery how many people can come from many places and make the decision to be one that's the theme of ecclesiology uh, but in the book of Galatians you find that there was a theme of stability pay attention now there was a theme of stability the, 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 the church at Galatia was being taught at theological extremes they were either all the way left or they were all the way right and so the way Paul writes is I want you to stay true church at Galatia to what I taught you there's a lot of warnings about them beginning in the spirit and being tempted to go off in the flesh because they found out that it was easier to do and to understand and to relate after the flesh and more complex to understand after the spirit so very much to how we are today they did a lot of vacillation and they did a lot of back and forth in the church of Galatia so this is why in the book of Galatians Paul Paul tells them I want you to be centered around and based upon the teaching of the fruit of the Spirit because the only way you're going to stop uh, vacillating is if you take the time to grow so the book of Galatians is a book whose history is around the growth pattern and the growth process of those that believe just a little history for you but that God dang Corinth that daggone Corinth that Corinth, that Corinth, that Corinth, Corinth is Paul's functional epistle. You find that to the Corinthian church, he teaches that church on how to function oh yeah he teaches them that it is imperative that you not only come alive and that you not only be activated and that you not only be placed and that you not only be stirred but you got to learn how to function and it is interesting that as you peruse and as you journey through the book of Corinthians in every chapter do the research he is talking about functional malfunctions about people who could be in the same place and be struggling in understanding the necessity of doing it together and in order for you to understand this you got to understand what the city of Corinth was like first of all it was the riches of the campuses when you dealt with Paul's apostolic seed which is a biblical term for everything under his apostleship Corinth was the most economically rich and here's why that city was also a city state now I know I'm born here but this tastes good 
to me it was a city state and it was the city state under Roman rule pay attention which was the only city that was trusted with the Olympians pay attention a part of what that means is that the church at Corinth they were the ones that hosted WWE and they were the ones that hosted uh, Monday Night Madness and they they hosted all of the boxing events and, and Mayweather would be there and Tyson was biting off the ear in other words it was the equivalent of a very high powered Vegas when, when you wanted to see something and when you wanted to spend some money to make some money and have a little town you know it goes like this what goes on in Corinth stays in Corinth and so there was a whole bunch of, of travel there God be praised and there was a whole bunch of, of journeying there and there was a lot of things to see and so in a city as driven as Corinth the culture was competitive I'm coming to you and so because Corinth was also the most gifted church the audience of Corinth had not experienced a functional detox from the culture so they come from a culturally driven entertainment driven platform driven pressure driven culture and they come into the Corinthian church under the apostolic sea of a man whose only message is grace and what happens is he has to pull out the culture of the city and the culture of the time and the culture of the nine to five and the culture of the grind and he had to replace the grind with grace all of that was in Corinth and so you find that this letter reveals Teresa that the gifted are also the dysfunctional I know it's quiet the gifted are also the misfunctional it is very possible to have a hold on your gift and not on your function a uh, part of what's wrong with many gifted churches is they've not found the right placement of the gift come on here and what that means is that when you're dealing with warfare 80 percent of warfare is proper placement so you'll always know that when seasons of warfare comes two things are going to happen god's going to call you to a new place or he's going to check you about not being in place and this gets really tricky because when you're dealing with any army the effectiveness of the advancement of that army is not just just battle weaponry and the way we've been taught in apostolic charismatic Pentecostal movements is if we got the right weapons we win the war but if you got the right weapons and you're in the wrong place then you are just misusing your weapon and you might even hurt the wrong people what I'm trying to do today is preach you in your place there's a lot of people that struggling myself included to discern what the next place is like but you've got to be resolved to find your place be willing to stay in your place and if God changes your place it ought not change your pace there is a brand new revelation of place now the only way that this is going to work for you is if you realize that the season impacts the placement and Corinth was not having it they weren't having it because here are some of the issues and demographics of the church just say yes here are some of the demographics of the church it was largely a Gentile church it had some Jewish believers so you've got a culture here's why I'm going to put some pressure on this text you've got a culture now of various theologies do not believe that because you're in the same place everybody believes the same thing number one and then you've got a culture listen to me you got a culture say put your weight on it you got a culture of varying material Maturities. everybody in that environment is not at the same degree of maturity they are moving in similar gifting but they are varying in different levels of maturity and sometime when you are in a Corinthian like church you will see the effectiveness and the fluidity and the precision of the gift and the ability to make it happen but all of that can confuse you about how mature or how immature a person is huh? but the real might behind any gift it's not that the gift is right or consistent it's that the gift is mature but when you got a place that is out of spot you don't allow God to mature you and here's why your maturity is placement based you only mature when you're in the right place you can never mature when you're out of your place you can only mature when you found your right place this is why what the devil does is he tries to puzzle people about placement because if I can bring you out of place I can stop your growth because a part of what your place does is grow you up you 
you will know when you are in the right place because you are under pressure to grow if nothing in you is being stretched out if nothing in you is under any pressure to evaluate if nothing in you is under stress if nothing in you is under friction if nothing in you is under frustration it's a sign that there's too much peace for you to progress ah, but when you are in your place you're going to feel some different pressures oh I'm working in here you're going to feel some new problems and you're going to feel some different challenges on the character level because the power is in the place sit you've got various levels of maturity and a part of the issues as I summarize this epistle is the eating of ceremonial foods you see because of the immaturity of the people not the theology you had some of the traditional Jews saying look at them when I was growing up we didn't eat no shrimp we didn't eat no lobster they, they in there and they already got hats on in the sanctuary they, they got tattoos all over themselves it's a demon because they can't stop eating shrimp and then you got the shrimp eaters with, with their lobster and their crawfish God be praised and, 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 and all of their food and their gumbo in their mouths and they're looking at these legalist people saying the only reason you think I'm in sin is because you're still a slave to the law so, 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 so you got that generation looking at that generation in the same place looking at the opposing audience saying the problem with you is you don't have liberty and, and, and you don't realize that Jesus Christ has set us free so you still think that righteousness come from what you eat and what you wear because you want New Testament privileges with Old Testament beliefs and so you got them in the same place and, and you got this issue and then you got preferences on worship environment remember Dr. Emma any, any, any classy theologian is going to tell you that a large part of the tension in Corinth was that there were people who were distracted because the women started prophesying and some of them would take their hats off and so you had some people who was upset about the worship environment they would say stuff like where I come from uh, the women don't sit on the front row I'm working in here where I come from uh, the women sit on one side uh, and the women sit on the other so you got a preference of worship because here was the problem some people was distracted by where the women sat and other people were offended by where the women sat and I want to mind you that this was all in the same room so there were people trying to preach and teach and glorify God but somebody couldn't lift their hands because uh, they were squinting at the women that were sitting in the front row they had erroneous beliefs and here's why good doctrine is important if you got bad doctrine you got bad discernment if you've been taught wrong you discern wrong so just because you disagree with it don't make it demonic it means you dream through your doctrine you discern through your doctrine and you differentiate from your doctrine but if your doctrine be wrong your discernment can be trusted oh yeah I'm working in here and then you got this issue of women in ministry there were those that were telling them I, I thought the women were supposed to keep silent and you got Betty and you got Barbara and you got Annie and you got Sue and you got Sally always getting up yelling in that microphone they, they, they cry loud over here and, and then they got the nerve to have on pants they, they, they sitting on there with jeans and, and foolishness and then they ain't got no napkin over their head when I was coming up in holy I believe that the only way you could preach and prophesy is if you put a head on your head I'm sick of this church and here's a problem the people that were sick of the church wouldn't leave they didn't have the audacity to get out what they did was they stayed there so they could make conversation because they live a boring life because when you are not in covenant here we go all you can do is complain one of the things that covenant does is take your complaining away but Paul said listen if you need to have these ladies have place match on their head so they can prophesy then have at it but at the end of the day your sons and your daughters whether they got on white or place match fruit baskets or robes these women go prophesy up in chair hey, I'm talking about Corinth then you had this issue of the plurality of leadership I know you want me to turn my plow. They had this issue of plurality of leadership. They were not used to having a team of leaders working together. They, they, they didn't like the fact that Paul took away the monopoly on the leadership mechanics of that house. I'll get there. What he did was he said, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to build Corinth differently because of the needs and the war and the battle of this city. I'm going to give you some apostles and, and I'm going to give you some prophets. But, 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 but the pressure of that background prophetess Erica was, what about my pastor? I want my yes, I'm master pastor. I don't 
don't believe in, in, in delegated authority. I, I want the man at the top. I don't want to talk to none of them deacons and I don't want to talk to none of them elders. I, I want to talk to the guy with the mic because the guy with the mic is the only one with the mantle. And so Paul said, let me switch it up. I'm not going to always be available because when I'm done with Corinth, I'm going to Ephesus. So you're going to have to get used to feeding from who I fed and you're going to have to get used to honoring who I've trained and you're going to have to get used to getting it second hand because if I gave it to you first hand, I'd kill you. I, what I want to do is feed you through who I fed and you got to be okay with that. You got to be very careful uh, with minimizing those that were born from the mantle. You can't honor the mantle and dishonor the sons that come from there. You got to be willing to discern everybody around that as long as we got the same DNA. Uh, I don't care how you cook your steak as long as it's done. Uh, give me what's on the mantle. Then, after you got this issue of the plurality of leadership, I ain't never text yet. You got prophecy regulations. And whenever you got broken prophetic people, you're going to have a bunch of mental insanity. And many of our churches have not learned the difference between mental illness and the prophetic. So a lot of us are calling the prophetic, which is really mental illness. And the more devastating thing is most of you don't know the difference. If somebody looks bizarre or inconsistent or stay up late or can't go to bed, it might be insomnia or insanity. But the only way we know that it's prophetic is if it reveals Jesus I know that's real simple and I know that's old school but there's a lot of people prophesying but they do not reveal Jesus the witch of Endor had a word but she didn't reveal Jesus there were people in the sorcerers in the book of Acts who could tell you the future but they could not reveal the word of God I wish I had some prophetic people in here that wasn't interested in lottery numbers and wasn't interested in names and blocks but was trying to reveal Jesus that's the point and the purpose of the prophetic it's not to point people to me, but to point people to him. It's got to be Jesus, and that's it, and that's all. He is the testimony of prophecy, and if he ain't in it, he ain't said it. Let the prophets speak. I ain't at my text. Two or at the most three. And folks were like, I thought we only had one, and Paul said, appreciate your one. But let the prophets speak two are at the most three and the ones who ain't got the mic have got to judge which means that even the ones in the audience should be paying attention and there are those of us in the room that can only pay attention when it's our turn if somebody else is singing we're not paying attention if somebody else is prophesying we're not paying attention but what Paul was trying to establish in Corinth was a multi-unit engine that was spiritually and cellularly connected where if something came out of heaven and hit one then the the rest of us had the responsibility uh, of getting the next piece to what was said uh, he was teaching them the power of gift under command uh, because a gift that's wild is not a gift that's effective uh, it's not just important to have a gift uh, you got to have a gift under command then there was prostitution oh no oh no way I thought there was prophecy in Miracles and church government. I'm getting to my text. But prostitution. You, you mean there was strippers at Corinth? You, you mean in the middle of activations? Somebody made an appointment to go to Shirley Sugar Shack? And then after prostitution bond there was incest one of the brothers there felt like because his daddy died that his mama was a baddie and so he dishonored his father by sleeping with his widow he said appreciate your history you are not mama no more you're hot mama and so in Corinth prophetess Stella got a groove back I'm working in here there was a change now she said boy I've been looking at you in them activations and in them prayer meetings I've been noticing when you walk down TLO that your wife is already at the back so why don't you come on and let mama teach you a little something and so th th there was some incest and some sexual violation then you had consecutive divorces because before people came into I'm just giving you history before people came into righteousness they did what they thought was right and the Bible said every man thinks what's right is theirs and so they married people for wrong reasons and came into truth and decided that their husbands or their wives were no longer the right one because they got saved when if you marry them they are the right one because 
because you brought them to the altar I'll get there later and so you had all of this divorce and then you had lawsuits you had lawsuits Paul is writing to this same exact church why are y'all in new images together and why are y'all in foundations together and why are y'all sitting on the last row together and got the nerve to be suing each other have I taught you nothing in these activations have you seen nothing at these conferences have you got nothing at these many 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 altar calls and now you got a lawyer who don't have your holy ghost who is filled with hell because you trifling ninjas can't handle conflict management so you got to get the devil to come and teach you how to work out fellowship in the house mm, can I preach this a little more then after the lawsuits watch me work this Khalil you had drunkenness Paul addressed that there were people at the Lord's Supper now I know that y'all got different beliefs and I just don't care but in Corinth they didn't drink Welch's hey glory and at Corinth they didn't have no juice from concentrate they had a very potent wine and the Bible said this is actually where the tradition of doing it every first Sunday come from don't get mad get glad because what would happen was there were believers at Corinth that wanted the wine all the time Jesus did it twice and, and at Corinth they were like no we got to get this a little bit more we got some incest coming got a little adultery here I need the Lord's Supper and so what Paul taught was that they were being judged not because they didn't take the Lord's Supper because they took the Lord's Supper to get drunk pay attention but when you've got an addictive spirit you will take holy things and pervert them you will take things that's not necessarily bad for you and you will make it an idol because now you're using these crackers and this wine to deal with your wounds and this stuff was never meant to take you out of your reality it was meant to remind you of the resurrection so you had a spirit of addiction a spirit of addiction say yes then most dangerously as I crack open the exegetical stature of this particular paragraph disjointedness disjointedness you are in a fast paced city everybody lives for themselves an individualist culture and you got all of this stuff in one house and Paul is addressing disjointedness ask me why by profession Paul in addition to being a doctor of the law a professional student of the constitution of the Jew and the Gentile one who studied at the feet of Gamaliel and became a scholar as it were on at least 10 languages on the side he was a tent maker and a part of what that did for the Apostle Paul was make him akin to an architectural engineer he understood the science of making different pieces work together pieces that were measured certain ways shaped certain ways made of different material and so now when you get into the mind of this literature you see he is writing in the language of his career when he says to them in Corinthians you are fitly functioning every joint supplying he is not assuming an experience that he don't have he is writing from the context of his collegiate level language and what he's doing is expodulating from the basis of his vocabulary because he did it well so now he's teaching them that a part of what I've got to do in Corinth is connect you gotta make you function gotta make you work together would you like to know the essence of chapters 3 and 4 if you don't I don't care the essence of 3 and 4 the, the, the message of chapters 3 and 4 is maturity I neglected to mention Pastor Erica that Corinth was the largest church Paul had the rest of the churches were estimated to be about 150 members and they all started in the house not Corinth Corinth was the church that started in the house and immediately moved watch me to a banquet hall and then after they moved to a banquet hall they went to a garden theater and then they ended up in an amphitheater because so many people were impressed with the prophesying and the healing and the miracles that they stopped counting their visitors and they start gathering in a public place so you have all of these growth factors and undealt with immaturity you got something getting size and character getting small 
you got something moving large and people acting little you got something engaging a culture and then others making enemies on those on the road it was very very interesting to watch this and now we deal with baby Heggy the issue of Corinth's letter can I preach now <laughs> Corinth had a problem understanding their need of each other Corinth had a problem with realizing that on your own you are insignificant inefficient incomplete and not necessary he taught them that you are only necessary as you are connected and so he started laboring in a revelation of connectedness and whenever you teach imply exhort gifted negroes talented negroes anointed negroes that they've got to be connected you're going to run into character you're going to run into all kind of lies and fears and deceptions and most importantly as I crack open this chapter you're going to run into the same competitiveness that came from the city watch me but this is not platform competitiveness say yes this is a more dangerous form of competitiveness this is not microphone competitiveness this is not money competitiveness Vicky this is not fashion competitiveness this is emotional competition I, I, I want to find myself fulfilled first I ain't scared of you I want to make sure that I'm getting happy and I'm getting satisfied and I'm getting filled by what I do because I don't know who I am and so I'm gonna make sure that I stay on the forefront of whoever is figuring it out first and verse 2 shows us Paul's feeling about this he tells them the reason why I can't give you meat is because you only respond to milk and the milk meat discussion is all about maturity he gave Romans the meat of grace but he gives the Corinthians the milk of function which means that functionality is easier than understanding the grace of God if you trying to understand the grace of God but you still don't know how to function you're going to frustrate God's grace by trying to use it to buy a function that ain't yours grab somebody say conjunction junction what's your function I didn't hear you say conjunction junction what's your function are you a are you an evangelist that don't play well with others are you a teacher that's unteachable are you a prophet that refuses to make friends are you a pastor that refuses to be open and honest how dare you say you're my shepherd and keep secrets what are we doing in here God by the Spirit of God is putting his hands not on new mantles and not on new ministries but on interpersonal issues if I be God's man in this house there is advancement coming beyond your dreams but the method here the formula here is before I advance I mature I got a prophetic word for you Applehead the Lord said to tell you grow up because a part of how you move is that you've got to mature in verse 3 of this Paul says listen I'm noticing uh, that although you're saved and although you're full of the Holy Ghost I've got to write to you like carnal men OMG you mean to tell me I can be a carnal Christian even though I speak with tongues and I fast and I shout and I do splits across the church and, and, and I do jumping jacks in the praise break and I play hula hoops doing great men and women and I can be carnal and Paul said absolutely because the only thing that's supernatural about you is your gift the only thing that's supernatural about you is your tongues the only thing that's supernatural about you is what you say but you still have very natural character and I'm here to break the spirit of regular off all nations if you don't deal with uh, and if you don't start to embrace uh, a supernatural policy code uh, where I don't act like I'm regular who am I talking to in this Anglican church uh, I don't behave like I'm regular I don't think like I'm regular when you still take vengeance in your hands and you still take justice in your hands you are acting like a mere man but you can't be a mere man and a miracle worker you got to choose a struggle if you're gonna be anointed at least be mature
You're acting like mere men. And, and, and Paul is writing this like, you're acting like those who are carnal, so I can only give you principle of function. There was a season in my life where I had disciples who all I could teach them was sex behavior. And, and I'm like, for all the stuff I've lived through, all the gifts I got, I got to teach you about STDs for years. If, if the only area of you I got to disciple is your genitals, you are not worth my testimony. I need to be able to take you into some deeper lessons. And if you've not done the first thing I told you to do, then don't text me. I don't care. Don't call me. Go ye back and do the first instructions so that I can vet you with your next level of obedience. I'm not an abstinence coach. I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Gentile. And what I believe God is trying to do is move us beyond the first lesson and press into the weightier matters. Mm. Verse 5 shows us further conundrum. I'm getting out of your way. The premise of this, pay attention. The root of this, pay attention. Whenever you have a lack of personal contentment, is going to show up in interpersonal jealousy emotional competition is the way that you express that you are dissatisfied with your life and if you have a dissatisfaction in you you're going to monstrosize and ostracize and criticize any strong area in me that reminds you of a weak area in you <sighs> So, so rather than reprioritize my training, prioritize my memory, my knowledge base, my function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to critique everything you do wrong. Oh yeah, I, I'm going to wear you out with my wisdom. I'm going to criticize you, post about you, ostracize you. At your birthday dinner, I'm going to take screenshots and send it to folk. I'm going I'm I'm to out you. I'm going to ruin you. I'm going to do everything but what the Bible says to do, which is cover you, because I am the advocate of the devil. So it's my job as your covenant brother in Corinth to make sure that whatever Satan is using to accuse you, that I validate and verify. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in witchcraft, because I feel this way about you, and I own the rights to your story. I'm going to gather people around me who agree with me so now what I've got in Corinth I ain't scared of you is folk that say I'm on Paul's team and then you got folk that say but I'm of Apollos and all of this is in one house in one city under one leader but they are divided by two different versions of stories that was none of their business I am a Paul I am of Apollos Apollos was a, 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 a first century apostle whose career was eloquence. Pay attention, it'll bless you. He was an orator. He was not necessarily known for signs and wonders. He was not necessarily known for demons coming out. And he only knew the baptism of John. You boy, but I don't care. He only knew the water baptism. We don't know when he came into the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but we know he could talk. And when he could talk, he had a shock value. He had a way to say a thing that would make men perk up and listen. Now, here's a problem. Remember when the apostle Paul taught Shondal Cor? He taught so long and he talked so hard that he killed a man because he was so darn long-winded remember the Bible says he was teaching and somebody fell asleep and fell out the window so you got one apostle who made folk listen and another apostle who just outright told us I'm not coming to you with persuasive words of men's wisdom but a demonstration of the Spirit's power he wasn't saying that it's the only way to do it he was saying that this is what I do so I might bore you with what I say but by the time I'm done signs and wonders is gonna be on the room Apollos was like I'm not gonna do all of that I don't have time to be rolling around with you but I'm gonna say a sentence that's gonna restructure your soul and it's gonna open a new season and both were right but in Corinth they didn't like difference they had a jealousy and a judgment of journey so the root of this was this comparison between Apollos and Paul verse 6 and 7 gives me my shouting point for all the sleepy heads in the room The way I'm going to treat this and the way I'm going to diagnose this unto increase is I'm going to profile and I'm going to categorize two different anointings. Say yes. Two different mantles. Say yes. Two different gifts and graces. Say yes. He says, listen to me, Corinthian children. 
Sometimes he used the, the, the term children as a term of endearment. Other times he used it as a reminder of where the maturity was. He calls Ephesians sons but calls the Corinthians children. My little children, I planted. I planted. I introduced it. I was the groundbreaker, the waymaker. I was the one who got dirty and I had the power to dig. It'll bless you if you listen. And after I got done digging, Apollos was necessary because I did what I knew to do when I was in the place. I dug and in that season, digging was my destiny. Had I tried to exchange my digging skill for his watering skills, I would have made a beautiful mess trying to do what I wasn't mandated to do. I wish I had help. Paul said there was one season when I was a digger. Now, Evan, do you know what this blesses me? Because nowhere in historic nature, I'm a preacher, I feel good. Nowhere in this historic nature do we ever see where Paul planted a garden. Jerry, we didn't see that this man was a gardener. He was a lawmaker and a philosopher. You know what that shows me? Every leader, every servant is going to have a transition of training track. He was a tent maker who had to learn to dig. So you're going to have a season when things are growing around you uh, where you're going to have to learn to do what you don't know how to do. He didn't know how to dig, but because he had the grace of God on him, he learned how to do what he was not trained to do. Don't you ever again let the devil intimidate you uh, by letting you think you can only do what you were trained to do. Uh, nor when grace comes upon you, uh, you can do whatever God wants you to do. Uh, and you may be the waterer in this season, uh, but you may be the digger in the next uh, the appropriation is in your discernment uh, you got to know at this dimension am I the planter or am I the water hey -ho, there are some people in here where God's about to put a new dig on you I feel in my spirit uh, that some of you are diggers uh, you ain't afraid of ground breaking uh, you ain't afraid of ground working uh, you ain't afraid of a shovel uh, the digger is the one that comes in deliverance uh, we were digging on Michigan uh, we were digging on Artdale uh, that's why we spent so much time casting out devils uh, we were dealing with the nature of a man uh, dealing with the fears of a man uh, pulling out the roots of a man it was a dig time and when God builds anything dimensionally he don't start with the water he starts with the dirt we still need some diggers come on Helen Johnson wherever you at we still need some diggers it ain't never too late for some people to dig 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 everybody don't want the dirt but there are some of us who are the cleanup crew and a part of what we do is walk up on you to find out what's wrong with you but we ain't gonna let hell have you we just gonna dig a little Bit. Look at somebody say dig baby dig Say dig baby dig Say dig baby dig Your strange looking son. Say dig baby dig I wish I had some diggers like Jacob That would look at the wells that were stopped up with dirt These wells used to work These wells used to run But the Philistines came And put dirt where the water was And so Jacob got a shovel And he committed to the well And started re-digging When God builds a thing bigger you may have digged at one level but you got to dig at this level if you are a digger don't be depressed find you some dirt and start to dig I planted but Apollos Apollos watered he was disinterested and messy throwing up and orgies and incest and molestation and, and trisexuality and he was disinterested in that what he was good with is finding where some seed was and, and listen to me oh I wish I had some discerning ears a waterer was a journeyer there was no such thing as localized water systems in Corinth which means that if Apollos was a waterer a part of what he did was journey to wherever water was in the region pick up as much water was necessary for the vine and walk his way back to wherever the vineyard was when you had been anointed to be the waterer in a place called Corinth your gift may not be the dirt but your gift is what you carry it's the same field a different weapon and many of you that are moving into a watering season the devil has been making you feel like you're not necessary because of the journey but if anybody in here has been on a journey it's because 
somebody else has been digging uh, and the Lord wants you to pour out of your capacity uh, what you got on the journey uh, can I preach like I feel this uh, don't you ever again be jealous at the journey of another uh, every tear you've cried uh, every conflict you've walked through uh, everything you had to decide uh, everything that was held back uh, everything that was released uh, it was not so you could whine uh, it was because you needed to water and your problem is you got it in you but you stop pouring out but God's getting ready to send the waterers to all nations waterers of men's lives waterers of marriages waterers of ministries I may not know Greek and I may not know Hebrew but I've got a journey and your victory is in my journey and when I'm a water carrier I don't hide my journey from you I give you principles from what I walk through parables from what I've been through wisdom from what I cried over understanding for what almost killed me and I water you at the next level upon us he didn't want to dig he wanted to show up after the dig was done here is the formula Kenny he identifies as some are planters some are waters and there will be people that are waterers who are going to put the water down and start to plant again if Corinth keeps getting larger then I'm going to always rotate planters and waterers that's not the message prophet S.K. the message is this I'm planting Apollos is watering but the increase yeah. you're not hearing me I, but God let me ask you a question I ain't standing there clock why didn't God do the digging? And why didn't God do the planting? If God can do the increase, couldn't he do the watering? If God gives the increase, couldn't he be the one doing the planting? Or, watch me, did God watch the collaboration of the planter and the waterer to see if they were mature enough for increase? A threefold cord is not easily broken. Sometimes when God is not increasing a family or increasing an organization or increasing a church is because he's sitting up with increase in his hand saying until you learn how to carry well and until you learn how to dig well, I'm not giving the increase. So the formula is this. Until the diggers and the waterers realize that we are on the same team, then God don't increase it and I can prove it In verse 8 the way he concludes it Danelle is this what is Paul what is Apollos except ministers that you believed by next verse so Paul is nothing Apollos is nothing you know what God's going to call you out of reputation I wish I had the time to teach you about how Paul said, if a man think he is anything, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You see, because I'm not defined by how you need me or what I do, or I'm not defined by where I sit or where I go, I'm not defined by none of that, then when you take it, if you adjust it, if you move it, my identity is intact because I was not necessarily born to do what you appointed me to do. My purpose is bigger than my assignment. It concludes with this mystery, Courtney. And we read it so fast that we miss this. Paul said, Paul and Apollos, the digger and the waterer, are one. Y'all didn't see that? He reiterates it by saying the digger is the same and the waterer is the same. But the increase belongs to God that's the mathematic formula if the diggers do their job the waterers do theirs I trust a place with increase here is the word of the Lord to people around the world God is checking this church and many others about forsaking foundations and I'm not talking about basic Bible belief he closes these 10 verses. If I just preach this homiletically with hermeneutic integrity, contextualizing this entire conversation, the point in verse 10 is this. 
one planted one watered all I did was lay a foundation a father is a foundation layer a father is a future creator he lays foundation so things could be built upon who he is and what he does I laid the foundation but take heed take heed about how you're building on a foundation you did not lay That word heed means take warning, be reverential about using the change of your function to corrupt your foundation. Whether you're on the first row or the fifth, this is still all nations worship assembly. Whether you're over foundations or carrying the offering buckets, this is still the place of grace and I'm concerned about how many of us are so afraid about the future that we've forsaken our foundation diggers diggers like Dr. Emma diggers who who would love people enough to minister to people that are nobodies that's a digger a digger walks up to first time visitors and says is this your first time here there's a word from the Lord that's a digger because it could be dirty we need diggers like Dr. Emma we, we, we need diggers. We need diggers like, 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 like Linda Jernigan. People who may have whatever they want to say about them, but ain't afraid to get stuff dirty. And even though people don't prefer my method, you cannot ignore my ministry. I got fruit. We need diggers. We need diggers like Keisha Cephas, who many of you wouldn't know how to pray if it weren't for her. Who, who many of you would not have the discipline of prayer if it weren't for her who many of you seek her out privately and ignore her publicly like she is not a daughter of this house and even a pillar she's a digger and we're not going to let her name be taken out by a demonic crossfire that folks saying I'm with Apollos and I'm with Paul the devil is a god don't liar dig woman Mike Weatherspoon was a digger. Yes. He got on the ground level when that music ministry was a mess. Didn't look like nothing, couldn't do nothing, had stupid props. Yes, sir. Dancers walking out like Cinderella. Snow princess, swords at everybody. And Mike Weatherspoon said, let me put my face to the ground. Yeah and find out where the new thing is coming from we're not going to get so distracted by pageantry that we miss the presence of the lord let me dig here listen don't mean that pastor todd is better or not he's just a waterer see waterers prepare in one place and they come in another Keisha Seep is dug in one season, but she's a water in this season. Helen Johnson dug in one season, but she's a water. Sandra or dug. Yes. Pastor Todd is a waterer. He comes with a journey and experience with him. And he's just looking for holes to pour some yes. stuff in. Keisha Seep has started on Champlain with 10 intercessors. Now she's been trusted to pray for the nation. Yes. And many of us treat her like a plague because we don't understand honor and we don't understand transition prophetess Gabby one of my the first ordained prophet in this house she ain't got to be perfect she dug and she dug without instruction and she dug without a manual and she dug without a book but she was there but I was cussing her out on phones because she didn't want to work with weaker women when I was rebuking her like she was a man telling her to toughen up and she was like look I'm trying but because she was a daughter she dug she ain't gotta dig no more she's got to learn what to do with her water Chevelle you ain't gotta dig here God ain't forgot your journey this is water for you baby we want to know how you got out we want to know how you stayed out we want to know how you reach people in the ghetto who's not attracted to the anointing pour your water and don't let these negroes set you up I was a digger but now I'm digging in different places. And 
this place I'm a water Apollos Paul we've got to strangle strife Helen I mean uh, Marva Cusert there's so many miracles you ain't seen so many sicknesses you ain't seen your love for healing is coming back it seemed traumatic because you went from digging to nothing but you went from digging to journeying the water is necessary you see when you've been on a journey you just got to find who can handle your water lift your hands worship him will you